Okay, our, thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Mario Martinez. Uh, and as he's setting up his presentation, let me tell you a little bit more, more about Mario. He's the son of migrant farm workers who came to California from the Zacatecas. As a child, he worked alongside his family members uh, in Southern California grape fields in the Inland Empire, where he saw firsthand uh, the uh, abuses suffered by farm workers. His early childhood experiences in the fields provided him with the ambition to be a lawyer for the United Farm Workers and to work for Cesar Chavez. Mario graduated summa cum laude from UC Riverside with a BA degree in philosophy in 1994, attended UC Berkeley's Bolt Hall School of Law, earning a JD degree in 1998. He was awarded a postgraduate fellowship by the National Association of Public Interest Law, now called Equal Justice. His fellowship allowed him to work with farm workers in California's Central Coast and to assist the United Farm Workers in a major campaign to organize strawberry workers. His work included support for the union organizing drive, as well as litigating numerous class action cases against the strawberry and berry industry. And upon completing that fellowship, Mario continued his lifelong dream of working with the United Farm Workers. And he is now, in fact, the chief counsel for the United Farm Workers, uh, having worked for the United Farm Workers for 15 years. Uh, 2009 is when he earned that title of general counsel and for 15 years, Mario has represented the UFW and thousands of farm workers in numerous cases before the State Agricultural Labor Relations Board, the National Labor Relations Board, neutral arbitrators, California courts, federal courts, and before other state and federal agencies. He has testified before the state legislature, worked on the passage of the various laws that uh, I mentioned earlier and that others have mentioned, uh, also litigated a number of class action and re representational lawsuits on behalf of farm workers and other low wage earners, including actions enforcing federal and state wage and hour laws and anti discrimination laws. Um, Mario continues to be a strong force for the United Farm Workers uh, and uh, through everything grassroots litigation, legislation. Uh, he does everything, and he now has his uh, own law firm, Martinez uh, Aguilas Ocho and Lich. And with that, Mario, take it away. Well, thank you, Genevieve, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I first of all want to recognize um, the, the workers again that are here, and I'll mention them again later in my presentation, but today we have from San Joaquin Tomato, Florentino Reyes, who's worked there for 24 years. Uh, from Garawan Farms, Alberto Bermejo has worked there for 15 years. From Arnaldo Brothers, uh, Claudia Santiago and Ricardo Santiago have worked there eight and 15 years respectively. And from Ace Tomato, Librado Martinez, and from Amaral Andres, who's worked there for 15 years. So I want to thank them for coming. And it's an honor to represent them and the other workers that put so much trust in us to fight for their rights. So the first uh, thing I wanted to discuss is certainly from the union's perspective, um, the, the laws on the books have not been the laws in the field, and, and that not only goes for the ALRA, but for wage and hour, health and safety, and, and other laws. Um, Judge uh, Sobel discussed earlier the passage of the ALRA. Uh, remember, the union had already been in existence uh, for about 13 years before this, um, had successfully reached contracts with the table grape industry in the mid-1960s, uh, beginning with the Delano grape strike. Um, but afterwards, the, the, the growers organized and decided to fight this, the early success the union had. Um, it led to a lot of, as many uh, people have discussed, violence between strikers and the company supervisors. In some case, the company used the, the Teamsters, uh, signing sweetheart contracts with them to avoid contracts with the UFW. Um, Governor Brown and various other people worked together. The supermarkets actually supported the passage of the bill uh, because of the UFW's boycott activity. 
um, and they just didn't like having farm workers and their supporters in front of their stores all the time. Uh, so the hope was that this would be a great opportunity for farm workers to exercise their rights with the signing of the bill in 1975. Um, the preamble, of course, uh, discusses balancing the historic imbalance of power with farm workers having uh, no collective bargaining rights. Oftentimes, uh, in courts or hearings, grower attorneys will argue that the law is not fair. The law was not meant to be fair, the law was meant to promote and encourage collective bargaining. Um, in 1975, agricultural employers sold about 43 billion in sales. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that today, 43 billion. In 1975, it was 7.3 billion, which would be about 32 billion in today's dollars. So we. We are seeing still the agricultural industry, despite all the challenges with labor, with water, with a growing price of land and urban, urbanization, they're still very profitable. Uh, farm workers today, meanwhile, are still very poor. I think some of the economists pointed to really detailed documentation on this. Uh, just as, as an example, Garawan Farms bragged two years ago that it paid the highest wages in the industry at the time, um, but still, whether you accept that as true or not, it was still only $9 an hour, um, which is not really a living wage. Obviously, farm workers continue to not have legal status. You've seen a dramatic change in the workforce, uh, whereas in the 60s and 70s, you had uh, a lot of Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, and workers with documentation. You now have a higher undocumented group of workers, a larger number of indigenous workers from the southern parts of Mexico. Um, just some interesting statistics there have been more farm workers deported in the last 20 years than inspections by these various labor agencies. Um, and until very recently, farm workers could not really drive, which may not seem insignificant until you, until you realize that a lot of times the supervisors or foremen are the people that provide transportation to workers, thus creating more dependence uh, on the company for their livelihood. Um, I mentioned this earlier, this is just the relevant language from the beginning preamble of the Labor Relations Act. Um, so we discussed earlier the hundreds of elections that took place in the early part of the, uh, of the existence of the ALRA. Um, so what we saw is the growers taking full action of litigation delays, so filing objections, many times frivolous, and then also urging the, the lawmakers to stop funding the ALRB, the ALRB uh, which was shut down very early on. Uh, so after 1976, you had a lot of reorganization, a lot of violation of the law because there was simply no way for workers to even file a charge. You had closing down of labor camps, firing workers, threats, uh, shutting down or reorganizing operations. Uh, forging signatures on uh, different documents, including decertification petitions, and using a false lists about who was working at the farms and who wasn't. Um, so the J.R. Norton case by 1979, when the California Supreme Court was dealing with uh, make whole and bad faith bargaining, the California Supreme Court itself found that dilatory tactics after union elections had become the norm and bad faith bargaining as opposed to collective bargaining agreements was the common denominator. Um, you also have increased violence by the growers. Um, UFW celebrates the different martyrs, but two that were murdered by grower agents were Rufino Contreras in 1979 
uh, during one of those strikes in the Imperial Valley that Mr. Barsamian discussed. And in 1983, UFW member Brendan Lopez was killed right after he voted in an election. Um, and there were uh, no prosecutions uh, for these murders of workers that were trying to organize. Um, once Governor Duke Majin took office in 1983, um, he appointed an anti-union general counsel, and we've discussed the dramatic drop in ULP filings uh, and the rise in ULP dismissals. Um, some of my predecessors discussed that they were actually litigating uh, bad faith bargaining hearings, and in the middle of a hearing, someone sent by David Sterling would announce to the judge that the general counsel was withdrawing the complaint uh, and dismissing it for all intents and purposes. Uh, you also had pending Maykel cases where millions of dollars were owed to workers. They were settled for pennies on the dollar. Um, you turn to the issue of delay. Um, one of the Teamsters leaders that frequently clashed with the UFW uh, recalled a conversation with the grower um, who was concerned with the ALRA when it was passed, and the company lawyer said, that's a joke, we can tie them tie up. They win an election, but they'll never see a contract. It's a joke. And that really has been the strategy for the last 40 years, at least one of the strategies. Um, Again, here's a quote from the J.R. Norton case I discussed. Um, we did a study on some of the UFW elections um, and the length of time it took to certify an election um, from 1975 until 2011 uh, was 325 years. Um, and just another way to look at it, um, it always has taken longer to certify an election when UFW wins than when a non-UFW union wins or when the employer uh, vote wins out. <clears throat> so again, the question, uh, has the ALRA been encouraging and protecting or fostering discouragement and abuse? Um, so I think the, the, the law and certainly for, for a long time has been unable really to remedy this these particular issues. Um, we have uh, you know some workers from Ace Tomato here who voted in 1989 for UFW certification. Um, the employer refused to bargain. In 1994 the ALRB ordered Maykul. Um, ALRB staff at various offices concluded it was impossible to collect make whole and in 2010 they closed the case, acknowledging some responsibility for the delays. Uh, Mario. Then in 2000. <laughs> I see our executive uh, secretary. This, this is in regards to a pending case that's before the board right now. And so any discussion of facts uh, will be up. We can't discuss this. They're going to be voting on this case pretty soon. I understand, but this is our our presentation, and um, I'm not going to discuss really any more about this. But it, it it is our our point of view, so we'd like. It's probably I, I, all right because we have all the parties, all the legal representatives mm -hmm. in case. Um, we have a company attorney to the left. We have the office of general counsel, and we have the United Farmers. Thank you, Antonio. And this exemplifies the very strict legal requirements that the board must operate under. And what Antonio is referring to is uh, if, if there is an ex parte, in other words, the board is hearing information <clears throat> from one party, the other party has a right to hear that information or to be informed of that information. So, uh, all right, with that, uh, go ahead and proceed. Yeah, and in, in, a, in a 2000 Two memo to a senator, the ALRB reported that as of 2002, over 34 million had been ordered and made payable by growers, what we considered to be a very low figure, uh, and reported that of that 34 million, only 4 million had ever been collected. Uh, in addition, in 2011 2012, the ALRB closed four 
uh, case, made cold cases from the 70s and early 80s. And just these four cases, uh, over 25 million um, was owed to workers. Um, and that's just what was ordered paid. That's not what the workers could have earned had there been good faith bargaining. Um, so with the lack of enforcement in the 80s and 90s, um, the union certainly did turn to uh, legislation, uh, litigation, public policy, trying to improve the lives of workers in ways other than collective bargaining. Um, one of the things that since 1999 the, the union had been working on is to pass a, a heat law that essentially would codify the requirement that growers have to provide workers with water and shade. Um, and we were successful finally in 2005 with Governor Schwarzenegger. When he spoke to us, he was actually shocked that he had to sign emergency regulations requiring growers to give their workers shade and water. Um, and that's something that we, you know, we continue to want to see improvement on uh, the issue of workers dying in the fields. And it's something that certainly um, ha has been an issue that's, that, that's been an example of legislative success on how to improve the lives of, of farm workers outside of collective bargaining. Um, the finish. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, because of uh, the make whole remedy not working based on what I've, I've here discussed, um, the picture that Mr. Barsamian put up was the culmination of, uh, I think it was a 200 mile march on Governor Davis with hundreds of workers and uh, finishing in, in Sacramento with thousands of, of supporters and farm workers pushing for the signing of this law which was desperately needed because growers simply would uh, would refuse to sign an agreement um, there'll be there'll be a sep separate panel later but the, the the basic requirements is that uh, for a certification that occurred prior to 2003 uh, there has to have been a, an unfair labor practice more than one year has to have been passed since that original request to bargain, plus 90 days of a renewed request. A mediator is generally chosen from a list provided by the State Mediation Conciliation Service, although oftentimes the parties privately agree to someone else. And it's supposed to be a 30-day mediation period, followed by uh, 21 <coughs> days for the board to review any objections, and the review is really limited. Um, and so far, I, I, I think, although there's been a few examples where this has worked, um, you still have the strategy of litigation delays. Um, now, we're talking about the growers who have been the worst in terms of refusing to negotiate, refusing to agree to a contract. And they've, they've uh, started using appeals, seeking relief in superior court to actually stop the MMC process orchestrating uh, decertification elections um, and threatening workers with closure or bankruptcy if a contract is ever achieved. And we also have situations where instead of abiding by an MMC contract, the grower decided instead to, instead to sell off its assets and go out of business. Um, Finally, the 2011 law that was signed by Governor Brown, again, seeks to remedy when there's uh, election interference by growers. The law is currently um, being tested on appeal by us uh, in the 6th District on what uh, the Labor Board's findings have to be on this issue. Um, it's still relatively new, so we, we have uh, no test yet whether this is going to be an effective way for workers to, to seek organization. Um, finally, uh, the, the list change. Initially, we had some farm workers that were different farm workers, but again, um, I would really encourage all of you to, to speak with our uh, the workers that did come today. They, they really are the experts in how the law has worked. Um, there's some, again, that uh, were there and they 
initial elections a couple decades ago and other workers who had more recent experience with the MMC law and different aspects of the law. So we would definitely uh, encourage those that have the time to speak with the workers about their experiences. Um, finally, I, I just going back to my initial point, um, it's, it's been 40 years. Um, we certainly hope the next 40 years um, is, is, a, is a better product for enforcement in a, in a more true uh, interpretation of the law that actually encourages and protects the right of workers to, to collecti collectively bargain. Um, so with that, again, I thank you.